question, have you ever seen a floating piano? Well, this comes pretty close. Recently, I got to do something pretty out of the ordinary. So we're on our way to visit some of the most unique pianos in the world. Based on my first impressions of each piano, I then improvised some music on the spot, which I'll share with you, as well as some exclusive behind the scenes footage at one of the world's leading piano factories. I had no idea such extravagant pianos even existed, but this little excursion taught me more about pianos than I actually ever learned in the past. Solo. So I was pretty shocked when I saw pictures of these pianos not too long ago. I almost thought the floating piano was photoshopped. I also don't remember the last time I visited a piano just because of its look. But I was also curious oh about this one and a few others because they're made by Fazioli. Yeah. It looks exactly like in the pictures. I've done quite a few projects on Fazioli pianos in the past, including my album Alice in Wonderland. And if you were following me back then, you might remember my video on recording myself on a Fazioli concert grand. These art case pianos I visited were quite stunning, especially in person. There's still Fazioli pianos on the inside, but they obviously have more of a visual emphasis than being maintained for optimal sound. Even though I felt really awkward about playing unannounced in public spaces, this experience was pretty creatively stimulating. So that is a floating piano. It's completely attached to the walls. There are no legs. Each piano had such a distinct character, so I gave myself a little challenge to come up with musical excerpts based on the visual characteristics of each piano and location. So here are some of the improvisations. Please keep in mind that I'm in public environments, so the sound quality is not going to be up to par. Here's the Kengo Kuma. This one felt like playing on a wooden spaceship almost. It's really modern, linear, and pure. It's designed by Kengo Kuma because of all this you know, stack of pancakes look. Here's the mirror cloud. This one is literally reflective. All of the needles make it look kind of fuzzy, especially from afar. It's very quirky and there's this loftiness to it as well. How did they ship that? So yeah, so it's <laughs> they shipped all the rods. We had to spend two full days, like morning till night, screwing them into the, the hole. And I did that so much, I got all these blisters on my hand. Here's the butterfly piano. This one has a fairy tale vibe to it. It's quite simple, naive, and wavy. Here's the origami piano. This one looks quite merry. The wooden details remind me of a music box and the white design makes me think of something ethereal and optimistic. origami master Joseph Wu, we invited him to contribute to, to the design. So he's the one who made, designed these shapes and said that we should put them on the piano. In the past, this piano had been down there on the floor and so many people had come up with their drinks and then they, they would spill them. And here's the flying Fazioli. I would say this is my favorite of the five. It's bold yet elegant robust and weightless at the same time. You can kind of see this is the piano. These pedals. So art case pianos have been around for centuries. The piano has always had different functions other than just making music. It's something that brings everyone together and uh, everybody comes around the piano. 
And uh, for the buildings, it's like that too. It's a centerpiece of the lobby. In the 19th century, the piano was the most important piece of furniture in the home and a symbol of success and of a family's values. I think it's also because, obviously, the piano is such a large instrument. It's also worth noting that at one point, it was way more common to have a piano in a middle to upper class household. So it became a natural part of the art of furnishing a space. That's probably why this convertible piano bed exists, or this thing. But in all seriousness, seeing these pianos made me think a bit more of how the piano has always had the potential to be an art or signature furniture piece. So here's the deal. The extravagant art cases are really cool, but they're actually not the most impressive parts. What's on the inside is what I'm most interested in. Which brings me to my next stop. I flew to Italy to learn about how these pianos are actually built at the Fazioli Piano Factory itself. We're in Italy. We're in Italy. Now, I got the thrill of meeting the Mr. Fazioli of Fazioli Pianos himself. And if you play the piano, you'll understand that this is a big deal. It's such a rare occasion to actually meet a piano maker. You are using often the tonale. And there's so many things I learned at the factory that would be impossible to fully understand without seeing these things in person. There's so much craft, science, and artistry poured into making one single piano. It takes about one to 2,000 man hours to build a piano, and more for companies like Fazioli that make most of the parts by hand. It takes two years of waiting time just to prepare the wood used for the rim and soundboards, for example. We build the soundboard here. When someone customizes a piano, this is never touched or no, customized. That's, yeah. this is no oh, compromise. Yeah. Yes, That's the okay. most important most part important. of the piano. Each string holds up to 200 pounds of tension. So with a concert ground with over 230 strings, it's holding up to 30 tons of force with its structure. So those are all the iron frames. Okay. Short piano, thicker diameter. Longer piano, longer string, thinner string. There are also about 12,000 parts in a piano. 12,000. A lot of this consists of material that reacts to temperature and humidity, which is why it's important to keep these conditions in check. Uh, we stay into the range of 50%, a very, very good humidity. And this machine can play more notes on a piano than any pianist could. Its job is literally to pound on the piano so that it's broken in. Yeah. Artun is our technician that was also in Warsaw for the Chopin competition. He prepared our piano there. Oh. Okay. <laughs> this is how much distance? Like seven millimeters, it's always the same. I think it makes sense why the piano hasn't changed dramatically since it was invented around 300 years ago. It has, however, still gone through many stages of development and evolutions that have turned a piano like this into ones we are familiar with today. That being said, a lot of tweaks and improvements are still happening on the inside of pianos. They're just extremely subtle and probably go unnoticed by most pianists. Our construction includes one adjustable capodastro bar, and it will be much more hard in the future to have to break strings. Those are only independent. Seeing the overwhelming amount of care and complexity behind the art of building pianos changed how I approach my instrument. It expanded my field of vision, so to say, when it comes to playing a piano. It's not something that can be easily explained, but it changed my mental posture as a pianist because I'm considering the whole instrument when playing a single note. Yeah, working uh, on the research a lot, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's difficult to make research on the piano because uh, they are very complex. Uh, the sound is something that uh, you can like, uh, I maybe I not, and the opposite, no? Wait, I can show you this, no? What this is, is the destiny. PF is the abbreviation. Uh, of pianoforte. They are also the initial of my name. Yeah. Uh, meant to be. Yeah. Destiny, yes. <laughs> so the next time you're in front of a piano, I hope some of this comes to mind. And if you want to learn more about this topic, check out this video I did with piano technician Damon Groves on the fascinating mechanics inside of pianos. Please like and subscribe. We're in a cage. Careful, careful. Oh, you broke it. Thank you. And thank you out there, <laughs> random strangers. So you're probably going to cut that part out. going to be left in raw. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs>